you familiar with it yet. Um, so Cork is a three years European funded Horizon 2020 project and it's run by a consortium members from academia and civil society uh, in Germany, Austria, Spain and uh, Argentina. And what we work, we basically work towards the rethinking of the role of civil society in research processes, um, I'd say broadly defined. Um, and our vision with that is to place citizens living in vulnerable situations at the center of participatory research and innovation cycle, so a cycle that we are developing also throughout the, the project. Um, so making citizens um, an equal part um, of the process, so to say, uh, and as far as it's possible, so that's one part of our discussions. Um, and in the process of the um, of developing a respective citizen social science approach, we are working with research innovation actions. This is where we actually have cases where we work with the civil society groups, and these address four different social problems, which is mental health care in Barcelona, uh, youth um, employment in, in Vienna, environmental justice in Buenos Aires, and gender equality in Europe. And the letter is uh, or was an open call for participation, which we had recently announced, and we just very flesh, freshly announced the winners of this open call. Actually, they just have been selected, and so con congratulations! I don't know if anyone of them is in the room. We we send out an invite also um, to to Funderland, Single Step, and and Women on Top, and we are really excited to to work with you on this very important topic. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so and, and GIG, so the coalition partner organizing this webinar today, we are the Global Innovation Gathering, one of COEC's yeah, coalition members. Um, and GIG as such is a global network of social and technology innovators or technological innovators and much more. So basically, we are a quite diverse community of innovation hubs, maker spaces, hacker spaces, and other grassroots innovation community spaces and initiatives, as well as individual innovators, makers, technologists, you name it, change makers from all around the world. And what's significant for us is that we work with a high sensibility towards contextuality and the different understandings and framings and risks in very diverse community contexts. And this is also super crucial, of course, when we talk about gender equality in the context of the shaping of a citizen social science approach and in general terms. Um, next slide. Yeah, so that's where yeah we, we would start like to start today and today we would like to discuss exactly this so it's all about the context relevant integration and therefore framing of gender equality in the shaping of a citizen social science approach um, next so as coact we are proposing a new understanding of of citizen social science as participatory research co-design and directly driven by citizen groups as i mentioned before or directly or partially driven by citizen groups and we therefore bring together um, and further, like the de develop methods to give citizen groups an equal seat at the table as we as we frame it through active participation in research. Um, next, and we aim at contributing to the collective shaping of citizen social science or of or also of the open science approach uh, that is rooted in diversity and that accounts for all the multiple and oftentimes marginal practices equally. But when we talk about equal seats at the table, actually, we need to account for much more than having an equal amount of people from different gender groups on the table, for instance, to keep to, to say it uh, that way. So if we critically want to address gender equality, we need to depart with a critical unpacking of power dynamics. We had a hangout recently where Adrian also joined, where we already pondered around the, about that. And, and uh, this is basically what yeah we boiled it down to. So it's like the, the critical questioning and therefore unpacking surfacing of power dynamics. And therefore we need an openly critical approach that proactively identifies, unpacks, and it not acknowledges and embraces the inequalities structurally rooted in those dynamics, in those power dynamics, and embracing so, those that are inherent in, in our work, in certain constellations of collaboration, and that are rooted in much more than, yeah, mm, like, very obvious gender inequalities that are rooted in traumas, personal traumas, personal histories, and so on. And the question is how to account for that. And this is um, 
if we can go to the next slide. This is what we are aiming at unpacking today. So how do we frame gender equality, first of all, in general terms uh, for our understanding, if we want to have a uh, uh, sensitive and also inclusive, like many contexts embracing framing of it? Um, how do we ask the critical questions that allow us to do so? And how do we account for for non-Western context and all of that together then basically results in how do we account for power dynamics and what we would like to do then in the in the co-creation session to to pin out like what that concretely means not in the shaping of to close the circle a citizen social science approach so we can go to the next slide so the plan today is first to learn to to listen to to Atria and Lisa stories to discuss and then to co-create. And I'm really excited to, to welcome our two speakers for today who will share their perspectives with us. And this is, yeah, to all of us, please welcome Adrian and, and Lisa. Adrian, Adrian Repka works with non-normative pedagogy and communication in a fertility tech startup, Mojo Fertility in Sweden. And he has his theoretical roots in organizational soci sociology, social work and people's health and has his background in trans activism, body and healthcare justice movements. His practical work focuses on loosening up masculinity norms surrounding fertility that have unequal effect, effects on how people on the basis of gender relate to the subject. And he's currently operating as a customer care manager for more gender inclusive, hopeful and vulnerable practices with Emoto. And previously, Artran has worked with the feminist initiative political party and his own intersectionally anti-oppressive organization development business. So welcome, Adrian. And our second speaker of today is Lisa, Lisa Sebacha, and she's a social, he, is a social scientist and working at the Center for Social Innovation, ZSI, and ZSI is also one of our coalition partners. So welcome, ZSI is based in Vienna. Their background lies in international development studies and sociology, as well as socio-ecological ecological economics and policy. Currently, they are studying early childhood education. And Lisa's research focus lies on responsible research, innovation, participatory and intersectional feminist research methodologies and socio-ecological transformations. And at ZSI, Lisa is currently working on the Critical Making Project, uh, Horizon 2020 finance project, which aims to bridge the gap between responsible research and innovation and the maker community. And in particular, they're co-leading the work package working on gender inclusive making. And critical making, on the other hand, is a gig. Global, the Global Innovation Gathering is also part of, of this project. So we have collaborations in different projects actually um, dealing with aspects of gender equality. So welcome, Lisa and Adrian. And I would ask uh, Adrian to, to start and share his insights with us. Thank you so much for the warm welcoming. Um, looking forward to talking to you. Um, I will share your uh, presentation now, Adrian. Thank you. Okay. Hey, that's great, thank you. So, hi, I'm Adrian, and I work with a company called Mojo. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this seminar to talk about critical equality and inclusion work, Kirsty and Anna and Coact. So this is my main point of today, that creating equality in organizations is actually impossible, but we still need to try. <clears throat> so why is it impossible? I'll get back to that shortly. Just uh, want to tell you a bit about my context and my background, even though uh, Kirsty, you presented me so thoroughly. Uh, so next, please. <clears throat> so Mojo Fertility is a tech startup. And um, it works with democratizing fertility care using AI and robotics. 
as my brilliant colleagues that have developed this uh, microscope that does uh, salmon analysis um, that are super efficient and accurate. And we have just opened up a lab in Stockholm in Sweden, where I come from, and I currently live in Malmö, Sweden. My colleagues are spread out all throughout Europe. And the aim with this democratization is to make fertility tests widely, widely accessible. And my work with Mojo is about challenging norms about masculinity and gender, gender equality, gender inclusion, gender diversity, to involve the sperm bearing population in relating to fertility as a thing uh, in a field that is today largely focused on the child bearing populations. So next, please. So as my background said, I worked a lot with organization and equality and inclusivity. And so this uh, perspective that I'm taking that it's impossible might be a bit shocking. So why is it impossible, do I think? Next slide, please. Well, it's because injustice is ingrained into our bodies. Uh, it's nothing that that nothing that we will do in our rooms can change that. It can't erase the differences and equalities that have formed us in our lives and in all other rooms we have ever participated in. Um, so it's not just about certain small points of adversity like name calling in the streets or um, and, and things that minorities um, face in like the, the, the very visible perspective, but it's about the basic distribution of power and resources. Uh, and we can see it as poverty, we can see it as experiences of workplace discrimination, minority stress, um, addiction, lack of network, and access to healthcare, for example. So these can't be erased with anything, with any organization skill we have, since we bring in these very material facts and experience into any room we participate in. But the differences can be acknowledged and even doubt to some degree. Next, please. So what we see here uh, is, um, is a circle that has is like shared into different um, different pieces, and we can understand each of these pieces as a system of power, opportunity, or privilege, so, such as gender, age, class, ideas of race and ethnicity that form our lives in society. So, from an intersectional perspective, um, I know. COACT works with a bottom-up perspective. And we can also think about it as like all of these pieces as one pyramid. Uh, and we work from a, a margins to center uh, kind of perspective in a like complex, uh, in, in the intersectional complexity of, um, um, of power. So what is centered, what is made margin, marginalized? What are the needs in the margins? How can we focus those needs uh, when we start our work is the, is the question here. Uh, and also acknowledge that within our communities, like if we want to interact with communities, <clears throat> there are also differences in power, of course, within those communities. Mm, so in my field, I would ask, like who stands the furthest from their reproductive freedom, access to healthcare, and what are the needs of those groups? So speaking about equality as something possible can sometimes mask injustice. Since we, if we talk about it like, yeah, we're doing it here. So just saying that we can never do it here, but we will try and we will, we will work on it. And also speaking about diversity can mask power dynamics if we don't <clears throat> ask on whose, um, on whose terms are, um, are these um, processes based on like whose needs. 
Next, please. So I work with um, many different perspectives in my work. So three of the perspectives that I work with in my everyday work is trying to rework power um, with a vision of equality that are decolonization, involvement, and inclusion. Decolonization means to me to the idea of toxic masculinity that would often be from a white or Western Northern perspective that would attribute um, toxic masculinity to uh, like non-Western, non-Northern masculinities as, as like macho culture, aggression, verbal heterosexism, for example, and get curious about like, how do Northern and Eastern European white men, for example, enact toxic masculinities um, <clears throat> that have symptoms of isolation, alcohol and drug addiction, mm -hmm. high suicide rates, and um, also a uh, trigger warning here about mentioning rape culture as well. So that we don't reinforce colonial bias when we address and want to revision um, gender and uh, vulnerable masculinity. Next, please. Involvement is another thing, uh, another part of what I work with, and it's um, being out there where the people are and collaborate and interact with people uh, and uh, NGOs, for example. This uh, picture is from a campaign where we participated in and worked with an NGO uh, last week, um, which, which is about men and masculinities opening up about sensitive topics. And we shared and encouraged our followers to open up about fertility related issues. Next, please. And the last, um, and the last uh, perspective is uh, inclusive work, inclusive language. And um, is it possible to play this? Um, it might have a play button. So this is a bit macho still, but it's a, it's a good example of how we work with like translating the knowledge that all people that have sperm won't relate to the same words for their bodies or practices. Uh, and having this in mind, like, what would we call it? Like, how do we work? Um, so we get a broad base of inclusion when we do our communication. Um, so that's also like uh, creating this margins to center um, perspective in who is included, who is talked to, who is an actor in the fertility uh, field. And next, please. So just to sum it up, um, it is impossible to create equality um, within anything that we do in our organizations, but we will try and we are still a company and um, we are a business that has this product, but we will use the space that we have to make, try and push some perspectives forward and to include and change some perceptions about gender and um, masculinity and uh, hopefully create a more hopeful future. And please uh, ask questions and connect with me and us with um, 
mymojo.ai, for example, or email me on adrian at mojofertility.co. Thank you. Thanks so much, Adrian. This is super insightful, very interesting. And we will get to discussing all together after uh, Lisa's presentation. So for now, I would like to welcome Lisa and ask you to share your insights, your perspective with us. Thank you very much, Adrian. <laughs> I have the possibility to just say this <laughs> right now. <laughs> um, my presentation is taking a slightly different um, route and I'm presenting to you what we have uh, found in the critical making project where we, as you have heard before, also looked into gender equality. And so one idea of this project, which is also Horizon 2020 funded, is to look into how maker communities are approaching gender inclusiveness and, and what, what are, is it they are doing. And um, maybe we might relate uh, what we are presenting or what I'm presenting, what we as a team in critical making have worked on later on, at least I hope <laughs> you find it interesting what I'm going to talk about. Um, yeah, so in order to give you an opportunity to also know what uh, what we have done, I'm shortly introducing you to the methodology of what is behind of what I'm telling you. Um, then um, this goes into the state of the art. How is gender, gender equality even addressed in, in literature when it comes to making, maker communities? And then also um, I'm going to shortly sum summarize the res main results or some of the main results we have um, found in our case studies and analysis we have done. So um, as a methodology, we have started <laughs> with defining both uh, gender and critical making. I'm going into that in a minute or even a second. Uh, yeah, we have then gone into a state of the art literature analysis to even see where we are going to start from. And in the case studies, we have first um, yeah, started doing a workshop with 11 um, persons working in makerspaces or being part of part of work, uh, makerspace uh, programs, projects. Um, and with the support of these uh, practitioners, we have come up with an analytical framework to um, do further desktop research and looking in, um, on the internet or to find and collect a lot of spaces that are somewhat concerned with gender equality in their programs, in their approaches. And uh, we've reached out to many of these and then we have finally conducted 11 qualitative interviews. So, <laughs> and I think, um, this is the definition I have uh, already hinted at before. When we talk about gender, and this is I'm really thankful to Adrian um, to, to have had the presentation before me, but also to talk about masculinities because this is a very, very important part of gender. Gender is often in, in public discourse is often just equated with meaning women and girls. So when you talk when I when it's about gender and making, most people think about it's about women and girls. In making and this is of course partly true but it's only part of the story <laughs> because um, gender is not something only girls and women have but it's related to trans persons non-binary persons um, male persons cis inter so to a lot of different gender groups and the very thing about gender is that it's not just a box <laughs> but it's rather a relational concept a system of social order that is very much tied to this power power differentials also adrian has um, hinted about and these power differentials actually make it so relevant for us to act on gender equality because it's just at the moment it's just not not the case that each gender group has um, yeah even has a say and um, so we as a project team defined gender as a relational concept also as a fluent category and that structures our social reality um, it does not only uh, it extends beyond um, the gender binary. So um, there are cis men, the steatic women, but also there are trans persons, interpersons, and non-binary persons that can and could and should partly be considered the power differentials we need to take into account. And also, and this is, I think, um, context dependent, but also very important, Gender is only one dimension of um, power differentials, um, and it is often very, very often linked to other dimensions that intersect at the level of individuals. So, um, for ex which is the, the main <laughs> example, always 
made because that is what intersectionally was actually coined for black women. As Kimberly Crenshaw pointed out in uh, 1980s, they cannot say, well, this is because I'm, I'm black or this is because I'm a woman, but it, it's their common experience of sexism and racism that actually makes up for their marginalized position in society. And that's why it needs to be addressed in a common way. So um, gender is one important dimension, but it's not the only one we should take into account. And we should always be open to link it with other dimensions of social inequality to even get <laughs> a grasp of the complexity of reality we are dealing with. I've also included here the definition for critical making, but I think I'm not going into detail into that in case you're interested, we can also discuss about this later, but it's not the focus of this talk now. So I'm, I'm just um, leaving that out for now. Um, shortly, the state of the art of, of how gender is uh, addressed in the literature when it comes to gender and making. So in the literature, it's again, gender is mostly related to to women and women's disparity. Um, so maker culture is cis male dominated. Um, and this is attributed to the following reasons. Um, on the one hand, there are the societal stereotypes of who can do what, um, specific community, uh, ways communities interact with each other that foster um, certain, um, the foster the dominance of certain behaviors that are um, exclusive to um, women, for example, in this in, in the literature. And they are also nourishing some underlying values that make, make these communities not quite accessible for groups that are not part of these communities. Then they also, uh, literature also says there's a lack of role models of makers that are not cis male. Um, and uh, unfortunately, they do not have a quite, um, diversified picture of what male masculinities could look like, but it's just um, it's just quite a binary um, perspective. So, and they refer to general societal inequalities. So who is it that actually has time to engage in making? And I think this very much also relates to citizen science and citizen social science, who has which responsibilities. If you have care responsibilities next to your full-time employment, it might be much harder for you to even be able to engage in something else next to all these different occupations you have in life. And suggestions for more general inclusive making in our in the state of the art are um, on the one hand creating welcoming atmospheres um, to make the spaces accessible, to offering tools that can be used from different perspectives for different and goals also offer kind of entryways, training courses to open up the topics uh, that you work with and even also reach out to communities that are already working with underrepresented target groups. And also how do you communicate your offerings to, to the community? So these are in, um, suggestions from literature how to make gender, um, making more gender inclusive from a binary perspective. In our interviews, we have tried to open up our findings and interviewed uh, makerspaces that are specifically somehow approaching gender equality in what they are doing. And uh, we wanted to really delve into uh, their, to, to really see what are their experiences, what, is, what, is the, what are their knowledges. And we also tried to broaden our perspective um, beyond um, European and Eurocentric perspectives. And Fortunately, we could um, have interviews with uh, practitioners located in Asia, Africa, Europe, and South America. But it's only 11 interviews, so it's by no means representative, but it's really interesting from a case perspective. And I'm shortly summarizing um, the results. I hope that I'm still somewhat in time. <laughs> I try to speed up. So in, um, in the work of the uh, makerspaces that we have interviewed, we have more or less found two strategies, um, spaces uh, work with. And this is not, no single space necessarily only fo follows one strategy. So spaces also employ these two strategic roads next to each other. But um, for the sake of summary and typology, I'd like to um, put them next to each other as if they existed as ideal types. On the one hand, there are those spaces um, that follow approach A that address women and girls specifically and only exclusively. So make spaces that address women and girls, partly also female identifying persons, 
um, for example, female identifying non-binary persons, to create safe spaces um, for and to create new communities, new networks, um, having female role models, female trainers, female facilitators to really um, yeah, support, foster the idea, this is something I can do too. This is something that's also for me. Um, and um, yeah, it's really to support each other to create new maker culture, so to speak, in safe spaces. Lisa, if you get, could you try to wrap wrap up a bit? Uh, the last, I, I'm just sharing <laughs> this you. approach. Then on, thank you. Then we then then I'm cast up. Um, the second approach, and I think this is also quite interesting, is again not every case is doing either only one or the other. Is to create welcoming and enabling structures for everyone, and this is quite often done with a clear with clear rules set within the community. So these communities are not exclusively made up by one gender group, but rather they are mixed and try to be open and welcoming to everyone, not only specific gender groups. And sometimes even they are also more sensitive to other forms of exclusion. Um, and um, yeah, they all often also assign specific persons of trust, mentees to really create a different culture from within and also create structures to foster these different cultures from within. So to tackle the inequalities within organization, albeit knowing that maybe you can never fully succeed. <laughs> this is the was a short summary of what we have done. And Thank you so much. I hope this was somewhat <laughs> clear in the end. Sorry for taking up too much time. Thanks so much to, to both of you. And it's, it's super interesting. We'll open up for discussion right now. Like, um, yeah, seeing the same, let's say, reservations <laughs> um, you're sharing. And, um, but also um, certain approaches no? on, on how to actually address this very difficult to impossible question mark <laughs> aspect of, of tackling gender equality. I'd like to open up immediately to to the audience given our time restriction so that we also have time for the co-creation so i already see stephanie raising her hand please go ahead stephanie uh, thank you but there's also a question already in the chat um, oh. from earlier here we go yes i will read it out how promote self-reflection about power dynamics um one participant who is saying, I face this barriers on my projects and it's so difficult to deconstruct these hegemonic perceptions. Even with collaborative tools, some people feel uncomfortable. Um, so I, I guess the question mainly relates to, yeah, to the aspect of self-reflection and people's self-awareness and, and perhaps, yeah, giving people tools and also the space and the, yeah, em empowerment, the conf confidence to to address um, power dynamics? Is, is that what this aims at? I don't know who, who posed the question. But I would read it as, yeah, it's, it's adding actually one instance to our discussion, how to, within a project, within a group, within a community, address, um, address and, and, and break open the the aspect of gender equality of power dynamics and uh, what they are how we identify them but um yeah taking it step further to uh, acknowledge and to embrace that it, it yeah as we also said in the introduction no, it relates to everyone's own histories and traumas and so on and so we would also have to nourish an acknowledgement and 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 providing people with the skills and, and abilities perhaps to to do this self-reflection in order to to then contribute to the collective reflection i don't know if there are any further thoughts on this and otherwise i would hand over to stephanie yes i could say something about how i work um like how we collaborate and in, in my team that's like an i think it's a it's a nice way of like sharing experiences and um, and different perspectives on the topics or like the the stuff that we work on. So we have this general like collaborating atmosphere where it's like 
like every day texts and stuff is like sent back and forth and we give feedback we receive feedback and like nobody does anything like on their own so there will always be this like <clears throat> crossover of experiences looking at things and there it's it's quite easy i think to uh to give give feedback and give some of my perspectives on like, yeah, I would have done it this way because of da, 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 da. Maybe we could think of it that way. This might have a risk of da, 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 da. And, uh, um, and that requires like time and patience and humili humility on both sides. Like, um, I can't think that I can make it like in, in one chat that everybody will understand or, um, I have to like sometimes some messages repeat, but some messages that I repeat, people say, yeah, we know <laughs> like already. So collaborating a lot, I think it's uh, is one key. Do you have any anything, Lisa, that you think of? Uh, I personally also think that this takes quite some time to, to allow for these reflection processes. I think hearing one thing and being open to that is one uh, good proposition you have in order to delve into these reflection processes but I just think since uh, some things certain things are so learned and so so like already everything you do you act upon these gender stereotypes and ideas of how things work um, in your language in the way you approach other people in everything you do and I think it's just such an really it's a lot to to unpack this and also with regard to decolonize and it, it's just so it, part of our culture that it's really a lot of effort that needs to be put in there and I think yeah it, it re is really a, a, a process that takes time and space some guidance but also the uh, I think it also needs these individual processes partly yes thank you Lisa and Adrian Stephanie yeah, I, I wanted to add to this that I think it's very important that uh, you have someone to lead by example, because I think that uh, um, it's very hard to change uh, a, a company culture from, from the bottom if you have the least power in a, in a system. And that um, gets back to my question, because um, Lisa, you, you wrote that uh, it, it might be helpful to have a confidant or a person of trust in, in um, a, an organization. And I... Uh, or a maker space and I, I was thinking this cannot be someone who has no power in the system no so it has to be someone who um who is quite high if there are hierarch hierarchies no and and um and the power to change something if necessary yes i and this is also like these positions are also somewhat related to the code of conduct i mentioned just <laughs> that was the bullet point just above which was really about institutionalizing ways that in case and for makers basic often it's like you as an individual are approached with inappropriate behavior and so this code of conduct is there to institutionalize mechanisms so that it's not you who is already facing this inappropriate behavior is in charge of doing something about it, but it's rather others who are acting for you because of these structures, because as a community, it was agreed that this is behavior is inappropriate. So I think since these measures are already in place, the persons of trust are then having also like another other positions in, in, in this, depending also on space, of course. But I think this is a really important mechanism that is close. Um, present in a lot of different maker spaces. That's super interesting. Thanks, Stephanie. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask because um, that also brings up in if you have an organization um, that is, I, I don't know, a, a company or something like that, a code of conduct is legally binding to a degree. So there is a way to um, penalize uh, in a different sense and um, a behavior that is not according to a culture that we might want to create together. And if you have um, a, a, um, a context that is based on, on sorry, a, a, like a voluntary 
participation, um, then the rules are somewhat different, no? So, and and I'm I'm very much uh, thinking about how to create a space. How is it possible to create a space that is inclusive but also draws boundaries where there might be mis yeah behavior that is not that is not uh, helpful to. Uh, because sometimes you have to have hard decisions because some people do want to discriminate. Some people do want to not change their behavior to include. Some people, they do not want to be included. And I am very much, uh, I don't know how, how this can be uh, addressed. And also there, there is this, level, this aspect of this dimension of governance, who is allowed to make these decisions. Sorry, it is not point, uh, posed as a question, but it's extremely complex. Yeah, so so basically we have it's it's really like a, a very um, how do you say this kind of trapped in each other in multiple layered uh, construct now we are dealing with. So um, talking about power dynamics, talking about um, um, aspects such as yeah um, agencies within certain pro processes, but also the the acknowledgement of yeah not everyone perhaps wants to be included. So how do we then account for that? um yeah which moves us more to the spectrum of our trans acknowledgement of it's impossible to <laughs> but i think uh, yeah well what is a is a good process to try to disentangle all these layers in order to have them transparently laid out and then being able to to deal with them um or with partially some of them in each very particular context, no? Barbara, you raised your hand. Yes, hello, hi everyone. Actually, I mean, uh, it's doesn't, it's not very useful, I guess, uh, uh, in terms of you know directly interacting with people and power relationships. But it reminded me this discussion reminded me since we are talking about citizen social science and we're scientific projects and we also publish things. And I find it really important that we put more and more in our publications also this what's called. Uh, positionality statements or so, so that we really also state in our papers where we come from, you know, what kind of cultural background do we have, what kind of gender do we as research identify, and it often already helps also to see, you know, where there might even be some kind of power relations or, or aspects that we are probably not even aware of when we analyze certain things and the way we describe them. So I, I think, you know, I know it, it doesn't help in the direct interaction, but I think it's also still an important statement and important things to do in our publications to, to, to give more also about us as researchers when we write something um, like, yeah, where we come from and why we have certain view on things and, and make that more explicit. I think that, yeah, that's great. It's like as a first step of, of surfacing as much of information uh, um, as possible and profiles as, as possible. So for everyone to at least um, yeah, uh, how to how do you say like cat categorize? Um, no, well, what what contextualities we we come from as a first step, and perhaps also as a mechanism to step by step nourish increasing awareness around that, and make it by making it just more present in all spaces we we have. Stephanie, thank you. I I I love this point you made, Barbara. But um, what I was also thinking of that. If you have, if you uh, include a positionality statement, some people have more to lose than others. So for some people, sharing mm. their position might um, might be dangerous or or um, might uh, um, lower the, the perception of the objectivity, for instance. And of course, it is a culture that I think should be changed, needs to be addressed, needs to be tackled. And and um, I. I um, but, but I, I do think that is a great idea, but I also think that it's something that, that needs to be um, a step that needs to be undertaken carefully because there are some people who have something to lose if they include a statement of positionality. Um, Cassie, there are two more questions in the in the chat. Um, Sandra asked whether we have an exercise or you have an exercise in your teams to make power dynamics explicit. Anyone? No. I try not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
But I would like to say something about this uh, thing that Stephanie brought up about um, like addressing workplace harassment and such, if I can. Mm -hmm. I think it's a lot about like giving the, the matter some weight to see like this is like when harassment, for example, happens, like sex, sexual harassment, that that like engages people on, on the same level that any other kind of crisis would uh, in a workplace to make it an organizational matter, not an individual matter that it often becomes, uh, which points out the victims of the, the harassment, for example. So that, that the organization is ready to upscale and to, to show uh, some consequences when these things happen. I think that's that's important, and that's also and those that um, these per perspectives and actions are are already in place before um, before harassment happens because it's also acknowledging this thing that we can't do anything um, to like make our organizations equal, like we bring in our equality inequalities into organizations and how do we address when things happen um and and that uh is also a matter of like organizing intersectional crisis organizations and saying like who defines what's a crisis uh what values do mm -hmm. we protect when we upscale our crisis organizations what competencies do people need to have when joining this organization um thanks Thank you so much. Great. I will read out the, uh, the other question or comment we have here. Um, this is Raquel writing. No, it's really complex. It must uh, be a, a systemic thinking and bottom-up engagement and action, I think. Nowadays, companies create much more top-down strategies in gender equality. Yeah, and that's perhaps now this acknowledgement um, that we see like there, there has been increasing attention on it and everyone like um, co companies, whatever, needs to do or feel the need to position themselves to do something with it. But the question is in how thoroughly they actually go through these reflection processes and in how far they actually don't stick to the to the stereotypes, what you say, uh, said Atra and also in the beginning, no, that can create actually stronger biases stronger uh, patterns of, of exclusion than than any inclusion um, or if they yeah actually are open to really challenge their their stereos, their 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 um, patterns of inequality and so on and and uh, for instance through as, as in the case of your company Adrian getting in someone with a really critical and challenging approach and being open to to run with this no one thing yeah did you want to comment on that <laughs> i'm just yeah if you have one otherwise we move to the co-creation <laughs> i can just say yes and pass it on thanks yeah so i, I really I, I think this is a, such a rich discussion which could go on and on we we had prepared uh however a mirror board in order to to map out those things we're discussing and and kind of um capturing them uh as one step in the process of of pondering about this and looking into and and further and further unpacking what what we should do about this uh, about this and our knowledge we gather and our reflections um, in the creation of for instance the citizen social science approach but also in other contexts of course so i will share um the link here in the chat i already shared it kirsty oh thanks so much mm -hmm. anna and we had envisioned that as kind of a world cafe style so we have three tables um we thought we could break into three groups but given the time restrictions and also that our group is not so big i would sort of but mm, happy to to hear if someone doesn't feel comfort comfortable with it to say we we can all just leave our uh, thoughts our aspects on each of the three tables and then we get back together and look at it together and reflect on what we should move into the upper um, upper sort of pink-ish uh, for say 
uh, box as, oh, as main uh, takeaways. So we could take 10 minutes and we leave what we consider crucial in the three tables where the first one was meant to, on there I copied something twice, um, what constitutes a critical approach to gender equality? The second, what role can gender equality play in the citizen social sciences or should play? And thirdly, what do we need to account for gender equality um, in different, uh, in uh, parentheses, non-Western contexts? So broadly defined and, and acknowledging very different contexts. And that would then combine bring us to, to answer our, or, or not to answer, but to get some first reflections on our overall questions. What are the key needs to consider when to account for gender equality in the shaping of a citizen social science approach. Um, yeah, would you all feel comfortable with having 10 minutes to, to not go break into groups and go through it in a World Cafe style, given that we're not so many people and that we're also a little bit behind time, but fill in and then we, we jointly look, look at it and, um, and see what we want to actually have as our key takeaways. Yeah, sorry, Kersti, I don't know if you saw in the chat, uh, it's me, Barbara. I unfortunately have to leave and Sandra, I think, and Teresa also said that they have to leave now at three. I'm sorry, I had only planned it for three o'clock. So just to let you know, you, you might be a bit slightly smaller group. But thanks a lot for, for all the input. No problems. Thanks. Thanks so much for, for joining us, actually. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Take care. Yeah, so as the group is even smaller, I would even stronger <laughs> pledge for, for just um, capturing our thoughts there and then having a final round of discussion on what we, we would want to, to conclude on. So whilst we fill in, of course, we can freely co communicate <laughs> with each other. <laughs>
I'd say let's perhaps come back together and have a look of what and how we would want to to move into the I already <laughs> started doing so into the main uh, results box. Should we once maybe go through the three rooms to have a look? Yeah. Okay. So starting with uh, what constitutes a critical approach to gender equality? What do we have and what could we extract from that? I'll just read them out and we see like, how can we yeah, extract the essentials, I guess. Mm, so equality difference and deconstruction need to balance each other. Reflection on gender as mechanism of social order. Yeah. <clears throat> Context and personal background. So the, the acknowledgement of context and personal backgrounds, I, I guess. Uh, resignify social roles. Um, critically questioning gender equality as a popular concept. Yeah. And if I cannot read, I'll make, I'll make it a bit bigger. It doesn't work. Structurally integrating the unpacking of bias in each process, each as constituted step of the citizen social science approach. Um, also includes gender diversity and power analysis. Always intersectional. Margins to center, looking to the needs of different groups within the community and deconstruction of what gender is about and why it is so important. So yeah, if we think about you know concrete aspects we could advise to uh, the shaping of a citizen social science approach, I see you already started moving up things. But but yeah, I guess yeah, one one foundational thing is to actually make this step of acknowledgement of of unpacking a like a constitutional step of of an approach. So for instance, as in, in coex co-act context of, of their research cycle, or I don't know, maybe you could give an example from critical making, no? or um, same in, in, in your company, Aitra, no? as, a, as a constitutional step in the in product development or whatever. Happy to hear your, your thoughts on this. Sorry, say it again. I wasn't quite ready to. <laughs> No, it was about um, just uh, going through the post-its, no? Like, and thinking about, okay, so if we want to advise something to the shaping of a citizen social science approach, like mm. which concrete advices could we give here? And uh, to start with actually making this like an, uh, an established step to go through, be it in product development, be it in, you know, in the development of a research approach or a participatory approach, or both of them together, like in the co context, like having it as one articulated practice in each kind of process cycle. Yeah. Well, for me, it would be the, the margins to center to mm -hmm. ask um, where are the needs greatest, where, uh, where are the resources as, as lowest, like in, in, any, um, in any process that I would work with, that would be like, a starting point. And uh, for me, if I if I may, <laughs> I'd I'd um, I'd say for me it's uh, the equality difference and deconstruction part really was it's something that I find find super helpful because it says well you need if you treat something different because you presuppose difference then you make it different. <laughs> so if, if it's also a necessary part you to. Um, just treat or act some upon something um, in an equal way, but sometimes it is difference really matters, and that then you can't address it with an equal approach because then you reproduce power differentials, for so to speak. But then also, if you then do uh, these difference or uh, act differently, it's also and um, you need to be aware that you do not reinforce specific. Uh, boxes uh, that you reconstruct over and over again, for example, men and women as um, completely distinct groups and, and that's it, but rather also to deconstruct what does it actually mean? What is it, what, like the category you're reinforcing? So I think it's really this, this approach, looking what you can treat equal, what you need to treat differently and also how you can deconstruct the um, 
categories that are at work. And, and maybe also find out when certain distinctions matter and when they don't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I add, if I'm missing something to add to the main box, please feel free to. Do we anything else have on this in on this table that we, we are missing to, to move up? Otherwise, we could, yeah, we could have a look at a table two. So the concrete role gender equality could play in the in the cities and social sciences, and and then yeah, here. This is mostly related also then to the question: no, what key needs do we have to consider when accounting for that role? So I'll just go through through the the role post-its. Those who do science are also the ones whose. I cannot read the process. Whose interests are researched, the more diverse the pool of citizen scientists, the more diverse the, the areas investigated. So diversity and being very concrete about that or expressed about that in an diversity. Um, privileges a great blinder those not be benefiting from a system are better at dismantling it that's that's a great point and also relates to the relates very much to the margins to center approach i'd say no yes i think so too. Mm. then support the shaping of our understanding of and practice of inclusion and participation so accounting or embracing uh yeah those awarenesses and and mechanisms we we take from this approach from from this um of course relates not to zooming out and our general practices um thinking for instance also within coact now on how we want to be participatory but to what, what extent are we and what what do what gaps do we still have to fill if we'd really um be inclusively participatory to, to, to use that term. Um, it needs to play an essential role as we can only create useful knowledge if we take power relations into consideration. Supporting gender equality and the unmantling of power dynamics at the center of each approach that relates a bit back to this, no? Making it an integrated and yeah, central step in each process. Help creating a sustainable impact by including all relevant actors. Mm -hmm. Acknowledge how deeply gender forms and shapes our lives. So that's where, yeah, looking beyond the, the core focus topic we are dealing with, but actually bringing in what we also mentioned initially, you know, bringing in people's context, but also histories and traumas and, um, being aware of, of that those attributes shape us, shape our ways of engaging and, and everything. Give space and distribute focus to most marginalized and vulnerable populations, which relates again not to the margins to center aspect to an extent. How do we gain the perspectives of those who will not participate, seeing how class hopefulness and confidence play a role in any participation? So that perhaps relates to acknowledging the, the gaps we cannot fill sort of, no? So that there will always be a bias by definition, no matter how much we do try to yeah, create uh, diversity in, in our participation structure and account for, for context, there will always be the side that is not heard, the side that is not part um or the many sites actually inspire and guide participatory and empathic empathic approach oh, i don't know who wrote that if i'm not sure if i understand this correctly if someone would like to unpack that a bit mm. 
Okay. So, um, yeah, I don't know, should, should we move concrete things up here or I mean partially we can also later see to to combine them to then for for a final sort of um, list or, or kind of map of aspects to to account for. We always try to summarize the findings of the discussions in a, in a blog post after the event, so we will do the same with this uh, for this webinar as well. So we could look at the third table, which is what do we need to account for gender equality in different non-Western contexts, non-Western expertise. Yeah. So like to, to um, Adrian say something about uh, what I'd like to move up because it's it's uh, this part about. Uh, gain the perspectives of those who will not participate and seeing mm -hmm. that we who form these rooms that won't be equal, um, that we who invite are uh, not, we don't come from neutral perspectives um, mm -hmm. and that becomes like a, a, a hindrance and privilege, like it might privilege some, some participants over others. So mm -hmm. just like be aware that um, where we invite and who is inviting and on what terms, uh, yeah. not just saying, well, everyone won't uh, all, like ever be comfortable in these rooms, but how, how can we distribute? Like, how can we um, meet maybe people on their terms? Like, could they invite us? Could, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. like new perspectives, but but I think like the class uh, aspects of, um, I mean, academia, for example, uh, or whatever spaces we have to invite into, uh, who is comfortable there, uh, who's uh, um, who has an easy time voicing something. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. That one. Fantastic, thanks. I moved the post-it up, feel free to adjust or add another one mm -hmm. because it's, yeah, it's much more elaborate than, than the post-it I moved up now. And then I will start reading out the third. So yeah, non-Western expertise and here the, yeah, then the question now we, um, we have all lived through last years of everyone um, being very aware on having more women in panels than men and this and that <laughs> and this typical kind of no stereotypical approach to how do we address bias which um, of course does not do the the trick as we know so um, here then uh, yeah looking at how do we invite how would you get in and it relates to also how in terms of who speaks up and who has the voice and so on you know, in certain processes and and probably also the critical questioning of yeah who invites in is inviting in enough how do we make people actually lead those processes and um, that stereotypical participatory approaches um, oftentimes used are, are not really handing over the power no but remain to a certain inviting in um, so how do we address that? And at least how can we be very self-critical also about that? Because oftentimes we are aware and we don't have other means within our project frameworks and funding frameworks and whatnot to do it. And we are aware and we don't always like the things we do and we see the limitations, but it's true that there is potentially not sufficient also room for us to express our self-reflections on that and our awarenesses on that and the limitations. So giving more room to generally make this uh, transparent, I guess. Uh, finding a shared language, which also, which doesn't only relate to, no, um, to, to languages as such, but different ways of communicating, different communication cultures and so on as well. No? And that then relates to different practices of how people share information, how do they comfortable to do so, how to decode certain ways of expressing and so on. 
and always here again the the, the people who wrote the process please uh, correct or expand on <laughs> if i don't interpret this correctly <laughs> um that yeah relates to cultural patterns as well no cultural patterns of communication of expression of and so on and uh yeah decolonization um and all those also relate no reversal narratives also relate um do we have understand historical historical context of hegemon hegemonial binary gender systems that were exported and enforced with colonialism and therefore how things how this expresses or self expresses in certain dynamics right listening to other perspectives and the term listening i mean from a social science context and a communication science context of course is also a really contested one what what do we mean with listening and also you know, within our roles as researchers or as co-creators are we really listening no, which which relates to how much space do we give? Do we give? Which links back to the aspect of power participation and, and power dynamics, like listening as an in inviting in or listening as in completely giving room to potentially being challenged and dismantled all our own perspectives and having to rethink our own approach right from scratch, where we understand through listening, through real listening, that we have been mistaken and and here again uh, we end up in so often having huge limitations in what we then can change because of project frameworks and funding. So how do we address all of this? And is it, I, that's probably a next step of reflection then, um, is it enough to, to come to the step of, okay, we have to be aware of all of this and we have to start talking about all of this. And however, there are certain aspects we cannot immediately change or address in the moment we, we become aware getting yeah it's com it's complex <laughs> which then relates really pragmatically thinking also about how can we challenge you know, certain project frameworks funding funding frameworks and what needs to be changed there in order for us to account uh, stronger for for certain aspects and enact certain concepts we are very aware about of in terms of what does listening really mean and, and challenging certain power dynamics through re-listening and so what does that mean uh, in terms of what freedoms and, and, and space we need to, to, to be um, more responsive and, and flexible no, in our work. What else do we have? We're, we're running out of time, first of all. <laughs> Honesty about what influence that is possible in the process. Yeah, that relates pretty much to this, no? Like what, what can we really do? other than becoming more aware and expressive about things. Different cultural heritage that inspire new perspectives of social dynamics, indigenous visions of non-dualistic non life. Yeah, this is actually super interesting. And, and we had a session at DOTS last year, the gig uh, annual gathering about cultural perspectives and indigenous perspectives on, on the concept of participation and engagement and so on. And uh, yeah, we'll actually build up on this um, in the this year's dots, which will take place next Monday. For everyone who wants to uh, join, we will we will send around an invitation to to take this also further this discussion. Yeah, so um, I feel like we in full circle come back to the very beginning of the session, acknowledging that it's complex and difficult. <laughs> but um, on the other hand, having pinned down certain aspects we which, which which we can now further work on and differentiate probably and and look into what to do with it and what what needs to be do to you not know, to account for those aspects mm, perhaps as a since we already over time but as a final besides thanking all of you to stick around for us for with us for one and a half hour and and really like giving the attention and importance to this topic which we also consider really crucial maybe as a final step a question on like what you think how we should further work on this like because we, we usually have webinars on a topic and then we talk about it and write a blog post and kind of but it's, it's such a structural aspect we are dealing with here that it feels like something we should kind of continuously work on so probably the question what kind of format or next step would you consider um, appropriate in those regards.
if any. <laughs> Um, Adrian, if you if you have a concrete idea, you can start. Otherwise, I'm just saying what is in my mind right now. <laughs> yeah, sure. Anyway, um, either way. Okay. Um, then I'm, I'm I'm just starting. I think yes, it is a crew. It's um it seems that only having a only it's it's good to have a webinar. It's good to to have the possibility to talk about everything we have um, been talking about this one and a half hours. But I also feel that um, only having only having a blog post about it is something, but it's not um, enough. But then again, what what is enough? So I think um, it's definitely a good point to to start reflecting on whether um, what else can be done, and even if like since gender is, for example, or gender equality is also part of responsive research and innovation, actually it should be part of every single research and innovation or um, process that you reflect on gender yeah. equality. So, um, and there are certain ROI reflection tools that actually try to expand on what is it that um, um, sometimes, unfortunately, they limit very, very much to how is the gender distribution in your team? But often <laughs> they're also going beyond. Maybe it's also about seeing which tools you could use for your um, for the for the further process of co-act also with the, the projects that have won um, the calls and maybe maybe really try and see how you you can use these tools and and maybe also adapt them to the context that you need to thanks a lot lisa anyone else before we yes i'm also session? thinking about the the practical perspectives like it's uh, it can be a bit frustrating like uh that that we still need to talk so much it's always like starting at the same point like what's yeah. gender like what's gen inclusion what's diversity and um i'm welcoming the more like practical maybe toolboxy kind of best practices uh like what tools do you use? Like what has worked for you? Like what, yeah. uh, in what ways have you integrated this into your, um, into your innovation process or, or whatever you have? Uh, so more from the theoretical kind of mapping out the field, I think we've done yeah. that. Uh, and I'm quite done with it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to move on <laughs> to the next box. <laughs> so, Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, collect, yeah, collecting different methods, different approaches and experiences with those as well in a sort of a toolbox could be very interesting. Um, in, within COACT, for instance, I mean, we, we are developing a toolbox of methods where this could be also an integrated section. I don't know, critical making, if you, you guys are... Uh, we have co-designed mesh um, actions with practitioners to implement in their spaces mm -hmm. so they're really context specific um, and and addressing the specific um, needs that the practitioners have but in relation to um, gender equality so it's not a set of tools at the moment but these uh, actions will be evaluated implemented tested evaluated um, so and that's that's also one one part, but it will not be a check a broader checklist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite specific. Yeah, but I'm sure. I mean, in the broader community, like the open city social science community, the gig community, and your communities, we we will be able to to source a, a, a variety of different practices, no, um, on how to actually enact or attempt to enact certain levels of gender equality within different projects. So in, in, that could be a next step to, to see on you know, having a call for, for sharing different methods, different approaches, different tools. So that uh, yeah could be something to, to think about on how we could support this indeed, also from, from COEC side or all together and so. So for today, and we are totally over time, I I'd just, really thank you to yeah for Adrian and Lisa for your contributions and the great preparations of those uh, it was super interesting to hear about your work and um, thanks for sticking around thanks to all the others to to providing your inputs and insights for us to move a tiny little step further in unpacking this uh, this topic and and practices hopefully thanks everyone thank, thank you, you so much thank you Kirsty and Anna. Uh,
Thanks. Hello, Stephanie. Hello, Lisa. Thank you also. And and um, it would be great if this kept going to some degree. Yeah. Um, have a nice evening. You too. You too. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.